Hi, everybody. How are we doing? Ooh, okay. Mm -hmm. Hello. So I'm Mitu Kandeka. And I'm Latoya Peterson. And we are the co-founders of Glow Up Games. So we are a team that unapologetically makes games that centers black and brown joy. Uh, specifically, games which uh, feature new forms of play based upon our backgrounds, our cultural touchstones, and what we basically call culturally informed mechanics, which is a practice we're gonna be talking about today. So while most of our work that we've shipped and that you may or may not be familiar with has been on mobile, we actually work across a range of different um, existing and emerging platforms. And we have a particular interest in kind of what's the future of play, what comes next, and who gets to be a part of it. Uh, in terms of the things we've achieved to date, so we were really proud to launch a tie-in game to the hit TV, HBO TV uh, series Insecure, starring and produced by the amazing Issa Rae. And uh, we were proud to be featured on the App Store for our work. Uh, we also took part in Niantic's Black Developer Initiative, and we've done partnerships with partners ranging from Oregon Shakespeare Festival to Ogilvy and beyond. And on the business side, we took part in the prestigious Techstars Tech Accelerator. Um, and thanks to our amazing range of investors, um, you know, ranging from uh, music and, uh, and, and sports celebrities to funds such as One Up Fund and Black Founders Matter, we were actually one of the first ever all women of color founded games companies to have raised over a million in venture funding. Um, I'll let you think for a moment about what that milestone really means, so. Uh, thanks, yeah, it's a double-edged sword, it's a double-edged sword. Seriously. So, okay, actually, let's imagine for a second that you are all uh, a room full of venture capitalists or angel investors, some of you may be, some of you might not be, uh, but if we were pitching to you, right, this is usually the part where we'd be talking about, you know, more about our credentials, about our strategy, our roadmap, the way that we've really zeroed in on who our audience is and all the work we've done behind that. Um, the way that there is just a huge market opportunity for players that look like us. And that's been proven across other adjacent industries that if you sp uh, make diverse content, if you speak to uh, people outside of the mainstream, that you know makes a lot of money, et cetera. Um, and players who look like us are the new gaming majority. Basically, it's where, if we were pitching, we would try to anticipate the prevention questions that will get asked, and instead, try to get some of those great promotion questions instead. If you don't know about this effect, I recommend looking this up. Um, there is a Harvard Business Review article all about this, right? The difference in the questions that get asked. Um, but, you are not all a room full of venture capitalists. You are fellow developers and kindred spirits. And so, because it's February 14th, Valentine's Day, what we actually want to do is talk about love. Um, and this date, February 14th, is also kind of significant for us in another way as well, because it also marks five years since we incorporated Glow Up Games. Um, and so we want to talk today about love and about the journey and why so many parts of what we do are really driven by love. So Latoya and I grew up loving video games. Um, we grew up different backgrounds on different continents. Uh, I'm British South Asian, Latoya's African American. But we both had that experience of being the little brown skin girl who loved games. Uh, and, but realizing as we grew up that games didn't really want us to see ourselves and didn't really love us back in the same way. So we each, though, went on to work in and around the space anyway, because we loved it, right? For me, it's been uh, 15 years as kind of an indie developer, an academic, and an entrepreneur, and various other things. And for Latoya, it's been as a journalist who's covered games and as a media producer and lots more. Um, but we also both just did a lot of work talking about the problem and railing against it. Um, I did a talk back in 2013 at GDC, which was talking about the lack of race representation in games. And Latoya, I think you did one at South by Southwest that yep. same year. Same year, <laughs> same topic. So we got together five years ago, and we started Glow Up to kind of answer our own provocation, right? To really be able to tell our own stories, to be able to see ourselves and answer our own desire to do that. And more than that, to create the kind of representation that we wanted to see in games, not only in terms of 
what's on the screen, but also who's behind the scenes and who gets to be a part of the development process. And so we dove in headfirst and started tackling just some of the biggest challenges in the space from inventing a whole new gameplay paradigm, which we'll talk about, to uh, building a game within, a, within an existing IP, uh, to inventing the playbook for how to reach a new audience in games that the rest of the industry hasn't bothered to look at. Um, also, you know, working in mobile and free to play, but also bringing in brand new talent to the space whose voices need to be heard. So it's been important to us to do the work and to be the kind of studio that we wanted to see in the world. What we learned pretty quickly, of course, it didn't take us five years to learn this, we learned pretty quickly, that studios like ours were not necessarily extended the same benefit of the doubt as many of our counterparts uh, who did not come from marginalized backgrounds, right? So though over time we raised a total of around 1.5 million in venture capital, those were largely actually a lot of smaller rolling checks, which has meant actually over time a lot of just like constant instability and a lot of difficulty, you know, even knowing how much game we would get to build um, and having to manage that process. So why, right? Um, why do we do it? Our why is love. Uh, it's love for games and what they could be. Uh, it's love for all of those like us who want to be seen by the medium. Um, and it's also a love for the parts of culture that don't get seen by games. We knew from the outset that we wanted to tell our own stories in really interesting systemic ways and that we wanted to do that not by kind of, you know, literally reskinning existing kinds of games, which, you know, some people kind of assumed we were doing, uh, but instead diving into this idea of culturally informed mechanics. And so when the opportunity came up to work on a tie-in game around HBO's Insecure, we knew we wanted to use that opportunity to kind of subvert expectations around what a tie-in for a TV show looks like, and also be able to invent these new forms of play. If you're all familiar, at all familiar with the show, and we have a clip of it later as well, something that uh, Issa Rae's character does is to wrap herself in the mirror. So we wanted to invent a new mechanic around uh, freestyle and rap and word choice and self-expression. So our challenge was this, right? How do we make the player feel like a freestyle rapper even if they can't rap? How do we give them that feeling that they can? Um, and key to this challenge is our incredible chief rap officer, because we have one of those, uh, Dr. Inongo Lumumba Kasongo, uh, AKA the rapper Samus, um, who was able to basically take the way that she will rhyme in her head and tran transpose that into a game mechanic. So we call this kind of system that we built Rhyme Step, and the version we launched, we'll talk about a little bit more later, um, in Insecure the Come Up Game, we launched in 2021, and we were really pleased with the way that it resonated with our players, with our target audience, um, with some comments and tweets and things uh, here that you can see on the screen. So the way that um, the uh, current version or the, ver the version one of it worked is that we have these templates of lines or bars uh, with blanks in them and the player kind of, uh, which are tagged in a certain way, and the player will draw from their collection of words to see which might be suitable for filling in the blank. Um, an earlier version of this also sorted the words that you have into decks, et cetera, but that's something that we continued iterating on to make it more seamless uh, and make the system a bit, a bit more legible. And because you know, having a limited collection of words doesn't necessarily represent how people actually rap. Um, so the, the line and bar templates that we have right now are all in Inongo's voice and Samus's voice, which is a really important point to note, and we'll come back to this, because that means that there's an issue with being able to like scale the content, right? We went on to use the same mechanic in other games and, and prototypes as well. Um, we went on to start prototyping a mixed reality project which started life um, as part of the work we did with Niantic's Black Developer Initiative. Uh, we also worked with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. We'll, Latoya will talk about that in a second. And so as we were sort of implementing this mechanic in like other games, we realized that while our mission remains overall the idea of centering black and brown joy, what we were really doing is tapping into the specific expression of black and brown joy that is hip hop and the culture. And what if we could invent a whole new genre of games around that? Because there is a huge blank space there. 
And so as we move forward, we're continuing to iterate on, uh, on RhymeStep from the perspective of a few different creative challenges. How do we continue refining the system so that it, uh, it feels more expressive for the player? How do we think about supporting multiplayer functionality? How do we localize to non-English languages? Um, and crucially, how do we think about the content authoring pipeline? Because that uh, helps us to bring in a plethora of other artists and rappers and bring in their voice as well. So we have a range of styles of rap uh, because we know that rap actually is very diverse in itself. And so the other part of the question with respect to content authoring and scalability for us is starting to bring in generative uh, content, drawing on our own backgrounds in AI and generative work in general. And so we're currently using that uh, idea in being able to generate more bars and more content. But the specific creative challenge there is how do we replicate the specific nuance of the ways in which Samus raps, right? How do we capture her voice? And not only her voice, but the nuance of other rappers and their styles as well. So once again, Mitu talked a lot about um, why we do what we do, what we wanted to do, the how of Glow Up Games and how we came to exist and somehow survive for five years on, on uh, you know, 1.5 million and $20,000 checks. Um, but again, it's Valentine's Day, it's about love. We also joke that Glow Up Games tends to be a homegirls project. Uh, it's the love that we have for the culture, it's the love that we have for ourselves, the kids that we used to be, uh, the love we have for each other that kept us going. And so I want to start with one of my favorite songs from Black on Both Sides, Most Def's Love. They say that goodness in life belongs to those who believe. So, so I believe. I believe. Uh, yes. Uh, I start to say, and then I say into the paper. Like I will say, when I write and I'm trapped in between the line, I skate. When I finish the rhyme, yep, I start. So rhyme step in a lot of ways is a manifestation of love. And we were super inspired by other hip hop games that came before us, everything from Parappa the Rapper to uh, Def Jam Vendetta. However, you'll notice that you get a big budget rap game about every five or so years. It's not a genre that's overtapped. A lot of the game space is very into indie, indie rock. It's a little bit twee. Um, so we didn't see the types of cultural stories, the type of cultural storytelling, and the types of attitude, honestly that we grew up with and that we wanted to see reflect. So this part of the talk is a little bit twofold. One is how we built the system, what were the, uh, the inspirations, the early prototypes. How did we systematize language, which was a huge blocker in terms of understanding. How do you even create the first ever rap rhyme composition based system? Our game is not rhythm action, our game is composition based. Um, and then looking at the different roadmaps and the way in which we've created the product. And then second, a little bit more context about hip hop's representation in gaming, some considerations from a rap artist perspective, and then AI and how we think about culture. So first, hip hop culture is pop culture, and let me say this again, especially for the investors who told us this is too niche. Hip hop culture is not just pop culture, it is global culture, and we see this most definitely in this uh, Jeopardy clip. <laughs> uh, so this is our first ever uh, prototype for Rhyme Step. So back in 2019. 2019. 2019, yeah. yeah. Uh, back in 2019, when we first started to go to market and tried to convey what this idea was going to be, this is the video that we actually took out to investors and the publishers explaining both the show, because a, a ton of people also said, hey, uh, who is Issa Rae? We've never heard of her. What is Insecure? Um, at the time, Insecure was the second most socially engaged with show on HBO outside of Game of Thrones. Um, but we needed to contextualize quickly what we were trying to do and showcase what the uniqueness of this opportunity was. So here's our very first prototype. Do you want your man or not? Do you know your plans or not? You gonna go back home or not? You gonna claim your throne or not? Is you Khaleesi or that other Name I don't remember. Huh? I'm hungry. Let's go. Okay. The voice you hear is Samus. So Mm. I 
trying to take you to Paris. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, you was acting bananas. So I'm fine. Nah. So I'm fine. Open the bandage. <laughs> So over the years, we kept refining on that title. One, um, understanding again, once we started trying to systematize game language into essentially uh, combinations of systems we saw in card games and systems that we saw in other word games, combine those and put them under the hood, you see that things started to iron out a little bit, we shrank things down, it's not phrases, it's just one word, especially for localization and context. There are all these different changes that we made to get to what you see in the GIF, which is the final form that is currently in the App Store. Um, where we have the battle wrapping and you have three different um, selections based on context. Uh, this is what one of the spreadsheets is blurred out, uh, but these are the spreadsheets that control the words that go into rhyme step. And for each word, there are I think 17, Matu? Mm -hmm. 17 or so different tags we have to assign to each word to understand things like they know its context, what's part of speech it is, where it should fit appropriately into the player's uh, deck. And to understand things like how do you explain to a machine, how do you parse uh, in a computer ready way, the difference between saying like, oh, I'm hot in like a heat, oh, I feel really hot sense versus hot as in I feel sexy. How do we explain that? And how do we understand when the player selects one versus the other to make sure that we're scoring their context correctly? Uh, so we had lots of different challenges that we never anticipated, including um, our favorite, um, our social media manager at the time, Brandy, had tweeted this out because we had literally a month-long conversation about the spelling of guap, uh, <laughs> which is slang for money. Uh, if you are from the East Coast, guap, guap is G-U-A-P, uh, as you see in Big Sean. If you are from the South, it's G-W-O-P. And so back and forth, what are players going to understand? Which one is a standardized spelling? How do we even start to approach this? And so we did a poll, um, but we needed to solve for all kinds of things like different types of wordplay, spelling, uh, the reading speed of the average player, and the timed comprehension of words and choices, and then also the use of non-traditional or slant rhymes, which impact scoring but are a key part of creating a rhyme that feels satisfying. And so this is our ultimate result. We got to uh, <laughs> debut the beta version of the game um, in time for the end, the closing party for the end of the Insecure series in Los Angeles, and we got to work with, we got to see the cast and uh, have them have their reaction to the game. So here it is. After the Insecure game, we stealthily launched a second project in partnership with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. The reason it's stealthy, and that's a whole other talk, but essentially, uh, Nataki Garrett, who was the first ever black director of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, was, uh, was ultimately forced out. Um, so while we were working on this game, we had to do a lot of things, including uh, uh, register for security detail because she was getting a lot of white supremacist-related death threats. Um, and so it was a very contentious project to do. It's really interesting <laughs> to talk about at some point. Um, but we wanted to launch, uh, they had done a hip hop version of Romeo and Juliet, uh, based in the Bay Area, literally for the meet party, the garden party where Romeo and Juliet meet for the first time, they come out the two shorts, blow the whistle. And so we were like, okay, we have to be part of this. This is like the blackest Shakespeare experience <laughs> like I've ever been part of. Um, and so we created this project, Hell Iambic, which is also in the App Store. It's made to be part of the live experience. You're supposed to play it during the show. Um, but since most people know the plot of Romeo and Juliet, you know, it's easy to play if you want, <laughs> if you want to look at it. Uh, it's a lighter version of the system with the color scheme removed and the timer removed. We wanted to focus on working with, one, the 
live element of can something sync with a live stage performance, which is challenging to itself. Um, Shakespearean language was mixed in with slang, both in context, so both having to adjust the scoring system to understand those things. And then we used pre-authored bars as well as text from the actual play and added sonnets, so the sonnet formation as an additional rhyme set. So figuring out other uh, ways and affordances that we could use the system and other applications of the system because eventually we do want to expand it to other genres and other forms outside of hip hop. Um, so we learned quite a bit, including that players love the innovative like, gameplay. Um, they were also brainstorming with us, like what would this look like on level 100? What does this feel like? And so we, we nailed it there. And then uh, composition-based rhymes are really, really difficult. We were <laughs> very lucky in the formation of our team that we actually had uh, multiple team members who were very ver uh, immersed in hip hop culture, including Samus, who is an active rapper, and who is also uh, has a PhD in science and tech from Cornell and is an assistant professor of music at Brown University, where she teaches and is a professor of rap in practice. Um, big challenges, one, UI. We created a new mechanic, as we mentioned before. There was no visual guideline for us to follow on how to convey to players, how to build their strategy, and how to build their decks. Um, and then the strongest lyrics, as Miss you mentioned earlier, are bespoke, but that doesn't scale. And so even though um, you can use different agents, we'll talk about AI in a second, the strongest bars that work in the best context are still penned directly by Anango. So one of the things that we started looking at, particularly as we're in another uh, AI spring, is that AI doesn't hold the answers for this level of composition. It's a tool and it can be very helpful, but essentially, uh, as Anango puts it, it lacks the capacity for higher order rap skills, complex storytelling, abstraction, multi-register figurative language, so a line that works on two levels. For example, one of Sam's favorite lines that she uses, move my back to some future like my favorite trilogy. Three different references are in that one line. So that kind of, yeah. and signification, which is an African-American style of speech. Um, but luckily, both Mitu and I are pretty prepared for this task. Uh, Mitu is an exited AI founder. Uh, her previous startup before Glow Up, Spirit AI, uh, was acquired by Amazon in 2020, and she was the chief creative officer there. Um, as for me, when I worked at ESPN and Disney, they had me in the company-wide AR VR group, and then they added me to the uh, AI and machine learning group. After that, I went to uh, join Blackson AI, and so I presented at the Blackson AI workshop at this conference called NeurIPS, the uh, Neural Information Processing Processing Systems Conference, um, with my project called AI and the Trap, which was about looking at the social norms of AI and the social norms of trap music and how these two things communicate. So we decided that we needed to figure out a better way to explain what some of these challenges were having, particularly when you're trying to explain what makes a hip hop song feel real, what makes a song a good song, what makes a rhyme a good rhyme. So to illustrate, I'm going to use one of the, uh, one of the most iconic bars um, in hip-hop. There are many, many that we could have chosen from, but this one we felt like, uh, considering it was Grammy Award winning, was an easy one to figure out, and it's from um, Eminem performing uh, Lose Yourself, which is from his, autobiogra uh, his autobiographical movie, Eight Mile. His palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy, there's vomit on his sweater already, mom's forget it, he's nervous, but on the surface he looks calm and ready to drop palms, but he keeps on forgetting what... So the word M uses is spaghetti. And if you're old enough to remember this, if you were around for this one the first time, uh, that became a cultural moment, as we see with this clip from Dave Chappelle's show. <laughs> you from? When you're leaving? Nice shirt, does it come in your size? Do I come to your job and smack the broom out your hand? Something needs to happen with this comedy thing right now. So why does that work, right? Why, why does a rhyme like spaghetti work? Why does it work? Why is it funny? And so when we were looking at the scoring system, it is so difficult to say what's a good rhyme. Some of our favorite rappers, like I looked at 21 Savage for like figuring out one of these ones. Uh, 21 is known for rhyming the same word over and over and over again. In our system, you would get a D. If it's 21, it's a hit. So how do we start explaining these things? And then how does, again, a talented rapper like Eminem, he's going, all right, he threw spaghetti in a track. Right? There's, there's the only other pasta reference I love more in hip hop is Wheezy's real cheese moving silence like lasagna. Like that is my, that's the only pasta reference I love more. But how do we think about these things? How do we figure out how that works and it doesn't come off as wrong and it doesn't fall flat? So like everybody likes to do these days, let's ask ChatGPT. I was like, ChatGPT, 
write me a rhyme based on the word spaghetti. Let's just see what ChatGPT comes up with. So ChatGPT thought for a second. It's not terrible. It's a little, little Chef Boyardee, right? Got a hunger for the flavor, craving steady. Spaghetti, spaghetti, oh so ready. Can't resist the temptation of this saucy spaghetti. My favorite line in here, stir it all together, watch it come to life, feeling like a chef cutting through the strife. Not terrible, but it's not what Eminem did. Eminem took that word spaghetti and put it in the context of a story about being afraid to fail because you need everything to come down to one moment. That is storytelling. This is marketing, but we'll get to that. So Samus, uh, I use Anongo and Samus interchangeably. Normally when Samus is in a rap context, I use her stage name. Uh, when she's talking to us just as friends, it's Anongo. <laughs> it's the same person. Um, so in this piece for public books, Samus published a piece called AI Rapper, Who Voices Hip Hop's Future? And really, uh, there's just so many bars in that specific piece, but I wanted to call out this one in particular. The same racist market dynamics that have made Kanye and Jay-Z's deep fakes go viral cannot be understood outside of a larger historical arc that leads back to blackface minstrelsy as the starting point for understanding the shape of our music industry and our national identity. Perhaps sitting with this history means that before we use tools like UberDuck AI to share a neat or funny rhyme in the voice of a well-known rapper, we think about the stakes for amplifying this kind of ventriloquism encouraged on these platforms for future black artists. So again, as we were building this product, you always want to be able to use stuff off the shelf. We already had enough problems with just art, trying to find black hair, black beards, black... <laughs> creating all that stuff from scratch is expensive. So we're trying to find other solutions. However, on the market, there are so many issues with your common um, artificial intelligence slash machine learning powered rap products. One, unclear what data set is being used. And if you understand the history of language on the internet, if you understand that a lot of these data sets are being scraped from Reddit and 4chan, which are explicitly anti-black spaces, you will start to understand the problem of using these types of text-to-speech uh, data sets. Randomly generated verses normally contain a lot of misogynist or queer antagonistic themes, um, particularly if you're looking at scraping data from the 90s. It's a different era, and you can see it in the evolution of lyrics over time. The pronouncing language library I talked to in a second is funded through DARPA and excludes African-American vernacular English. You can't even try to approximate the way that I talk using pronouncing. There are no systems for filtering in or out community-specific words or parameters. We'll get to that in a second. And women's voices are either non-existent or not presented as of color. So UberDuck, which is interesting, provides a valley girl option for speech and for your performance, but has erased all other black-coded voices after a backlash. So Nabil Hussain is the creator of Generative Doom, which is a very fun uh, Doom lyrics generator. It's extremely simple, it's online, you can always get it. Um, but it's also coming from the same radical frameworks that we apply to our work at Glow Up. And it noted, as is documented on Pronouncing's own website, it is based on a pronouncing dictionary that uh, was funded by the US military to DARPA. Only general American English is represented in the list of pronunciations for a given word. Like many MCs, MF Doom employs African American vernacular English and he will sometimes pronounce the same words differently for reasons of character or narrative to obtain more rhymes. Therefore, since my program relies on pronouncing to generate pairs of rhyming words, many rhymes that Doom might make, or has in fact made, will not be captured by generative Doom as it exists. It is remarkable that computing generally and natural language processing specifically have been shaped so pervasively that, not ev that even a hip hop rhyme generator art project is indelibly marked by it. Samus also points to frequently Matthew D. Morrison's work on race and black sound. And notes again, I argue that the ease in which creators and developers, including game developers, have co-opted and presented the voice of notable black hip hop artists like Kanye West and Jay-Z actually represents the latest development in a broader history of what musicologist Matthew D. Morrison calls black sound, the sonic and embodied legacy of blackface performance as the origin for all popular music, entertainment, and culture in the United States. We see this most clearly in the uh, AI generator performer, FN Mecca. FN Mecca had a real world, real money cash deal with Capitol Records um, and was produced by a mostly white and Asian team. Um, there was, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but he was canceled after uh, this image surfaced as social promotion. Ask yourself why an AI generated character would ever face police brutality. 
Sorry, it's why? just so fucked up. <laughs> so fucked up, right? So fucked up. Why, why would they think that would appeal? Why does that feel like it's authentic? What's interesting is Factory New founder Anthony Martini, who is the creator of FN Mecca, said that, you know, he's, it's primarily an inhuman rapper. It's a black guy, quote, not named. And this isn't a malicious plan of white executives, essentially trying to, again, justify selling our culture and selling it for profit. Kyle the Hooligan, who's over on the right, mentioned this. Use me for my voice, my likeness, and culture. Got 10 million TikTok followers and a big record deal off what I created, then ghosted me. It is the same script playing out again and again and again. This is just the AI layer. So in response to that, we've created some initial frameworks for a black feminist game design. Um, so one, approaching the game with the desire to center the needs of those gamers most often pushed to the margins. Um, negotiating deployments of language that can fall in a gray area in terms of creating pleasure or pain for black women. Incorporating a black feminist disability framework, hip hop feminist and trap feminist theories into our design process. Creating multiple spaces for the contextualization of our characters and creating community outside of gameplay, one actively documenting our work and reflecting what Kaisha Jennings called a digital hip hop feminist sensibility. Um, so Samus and I were actually working on a chapter for a book that uh, seems to have died in the pandemic, um, but we created this uh, piece that we'll publish at some point called Put Me On Game, Insecure Digital Home Places in Hip Hop Feminist Game Design. And we noted in terms of just even talking through the conversations that we had at the studio were informative, instructive, one of which is how do we figure out con like difficult language, like bitch, ho, trick, how do we look at that? Because it's a reality in hip hop, it's a reality in life, but we don't want these things weaponized and we don't want things weaponized in a way that feels stereotypical or feels antagonistic to our players. So we noted, we decided to keep these words um, and we just unpacked um, how the appropriation of these terms by women rappers has been critical for their ability to play with the politics of gender performance domination and respectability. To protect players against the potential weaponization of these words, we added the caveat that they can only appear as selectable options in rhymes where the player is speaking positively about themselves, as in the bars, I look rich, I'm a dope ass bitch, or proud thought, never pop it for a flop. Further, allowing players to only use these terms in affirmative ways allows for a queering of the rap space within the game by enabling non-binary and male identifying players to use these gender terms in ways that challenge traditional masculinist, masculinist representations of bravado and pride within hip hop. So we got into the deep work and once again, we're doing this, <laughs> sometimes feeling like pushing a boulder up a hill forever um, because of love, because of what we care about, because we love the culture, because we want to see more studios like ours, we want to see more kids who look like us go into game development and to create even better things than we can dream or imagine. So to close with the, once again, with the words of the mighty most deaf, um, we build the now for the promise of the infinite. Thank you. Thank you.